This video covers the basics of recognizing and describing atrial rhythms. Before I go over the atrial rhythms specifically, I want to introduce a few key terms that we use to describe what we are seeing from the atria, but these are also often terms that are used in the same way for describing abnormal findings in many other rhythms. The first term is ectopic, which means misplaced. And we use that term to refer to any complex or pattern on the ECG that isn't where or when it should be occurring in a normal sinus rhythm. You can have isolated ectopic beats or ectopic pacemakers responsible for producing a rhythm. We label a complex as premature any time it occurs before the next anticipated beat. In other words, premature just simply means something came early. The next term is paroxysmal which simply means that what you are identifying starts and stops abruptly, or it comes and goes, it is not a continuous rhythm that stays indefinitely on the rhythm strip. Bigeminy is a term we use when ectopic complexes occur every other beat in a rhythm. Similarly, trigeminy describes ectopy that occurs every third beat. If we identify ectopy as multifocal and label it that way, we are saying that based on differences in appearance, we believe that two or more beats, two or more ectopic beats, are coming from more than one location or more than one focus in the heart. Flutter is a term used primarily when talking about a specific atrial rhythm, which we'll cover, and it appears with a classic sawtooth appearance of the P waves, usually at a rate close to 300. The ventricular rate may also be accelerated, or it may be relatively normal, depending on how often those atrial impulses are conducted through the AV node and passed on to the ventricles, and we'll come back to that. Finally, fibrillation can be used to describe atrial or ventricular rhythms, and as I'm sure you're aware, it is describing disorganized, irregular, and rapid electrical impulses throughout the atria or throughout the ventricle, which results in ineffective quivering of the muscle and no cardiac output from the affected chambers. Now let's talk about the atria specifically. Atrial conduction cells are structured similarly to the cells in the SA node, and as a result, their intrinsic firing rate is close to that of the SA. These cells can be easily irritated, and when they are, the automaticity function kicks in early, and they can produce extra and early beats, or can even take over the pacemaker function of the heart. One of the most common findings you will see on ECG tracings are premature atrial contractions, or premature atrial complexes, depending on the reference you're looking at. Either way, we label them as PACs. Complex is probably a more accurate term because we're seeing an electrical reflection. We can't really see the muscular contraction, but we're assuming that's what that electrical activity represents. So those terms are basically interchangeable. As the name shows, these occur early, that is, before the next scheduled sinus beat, and they originate somewhere in the atria. They may come from a single irritated cell or location, or they may be generated from numerous sites. Because the impulse is starting above the AV node, but not from the SA node, most PACs will have a P wave, but it will be different in appearance than the norm. It may be shaped differently, smaller in amplitude, or even inverted, because the electrical impulse is following an altered pathway or moving in different directions than those that come from the SA node. The PR interval will be less than 0.20, just like a normal P wave, and oftentimes it will be even less than 0.12, which is not our normal PR. The closer to the AV node the impulse arises, the less time it takes to get through and the shorter the PR interval. In most cases, a PAC will produce a QRS complex that is identical to the normal QRS for that patient, because from the AV node down, electricity is following the same pathway. Here are some examples of PACs. In atrial bigeminy, every other beat is a PAC. In atrial trigeminy, every third beat is a PAC. Causes of PACs are broad. PACs can occur in anyone as a result of increased sympathetic tone. This could be anxiety, fear, exercise, caffeine or other stimulants, medications, hypoxia, ischemia, or cardiac disease. Most of us walk around with PACs at some point. Treatment, 
Usually, there is none because PACs usually have no clinical significance and require no intervention. With all of the ectopy that we will discuss, whenever you see three complexes in a row of anything, you need to label that as a rhythm all its own. So, when you see three or more atrial contractions together, that is now an atrial rhythm. Very commonly, those atrial rhythms will be at a rate greater than 100 because the atria are irritated, and if so, we call that atrial tachycardia. Just like with PACs, sometimes there's more than one pacemaker site responsible for an atrial rhythm. We determine that by noticing at least three different P waves on our tracing. It's reasonable to assume that three distinctly different looking P waves are caused by at least three different sites. If we have at least three different appearing P waves, one of which might be the SA node, we call this a wandering atrial pacemaker. Those abnormal P waves may come in any shape or direction, and the PR intervals are likely to vary and often be less than normal in length. They usually produce normal appearing QRS complexes, just like our PACs do. Causes of a wandering atrial pacemaker include increased parasympathetic stimulation, especially in younger patients, responses to medications like digitalis, or even a recent MI. Just like the ones we've talked about so far, this rhythm is usually asymptomatic, and any treatment that's going to be provided is usually aimed at the underlying cause, not at trying to correct the rhythm. If our patient has a wandering atrial pacemaker, and it's fast, as in greater than 100, rather than calling it a fast WAP, it gets an entirely new label, which is a multifocal atrial tachycardia. As you can see, this is actually a very clear and logical label. It's coming from lots of places, those places are all in the atria, and it's fast. Whether it comes from one site or many, if the atrial tachycardia comes and goes intermittently, we call it a paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. And as I mentioned before, that paroxysmal term is used for other rhythms. Especially common is for paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, and we'll talk about those in another session, but SVTs commonly have that property of coming and going and not staying continuously. The causes for atrial tachycardias are the same things we listed for PACs, and the symptoms will be entirely dependent on if or how much the tachycardia is reducing cardiac output. A patient may experience weakness, syncope, hypotension, or other symptoms, and treatment is again not focused on changing the rhythm, but on finding and managing what's causing that rhythm. Atrial flutter is a classic rhythm that is actually relatively easy to identify in most cases. The baseline has a picket fence or sawtooth pattern to the P waves, which are also referred to as flutter waves. In atrial flutter, a single irritable site, usually low in the atrium near the AV node, initiates many electrical pull impulses at a rapid rate, typically close to 300 beats per minute, meaning flutter waves are about one large box apart in many cases. Those electrical impulses are conducted throughout the atria, which cannot produce effective contraction at that rate, resulting in a loss of atrial kick just as we see with atrial fibrillation. The AV node acts as a filter, allowing some but not all impulses to be conducted. When describing an atrial flutter, it's important that we identify the conduction ratio, which is the number of atrial beats in relation to the number of ventricular beats produced. In this example, we have a 4 to 1 conduction ratio because there are four atrial contractions for each ventricular contraction. That's also evident when you note that the atrial rate is 300 beats per minute and the ventricular rate is 75, which is a 4 to 1 ratio. To determine a conduction ratio, it's often better to look at those two rates and do the math than just look at the appearance, because in this case you can see you only notice three P waves between each QRS. That's because the fourth one is buried in the QRS, but there are actually four firings happening to every in the atria for every one firing that makes its way through the ventricles. In most cases of atrial flutter, both the atrial and ventricular complexes will be regular rates, or a regular rhythm rather, but it is also possible to have what is called variable conduction, which will still have regular flutter waves, but produce an irregular ventricular response. 
Atrial flutter will normally produce narrow and normal looking QRS complexes unless the patient has an underlying conduction defect such as a bundle branch block. The causes of atrial flutter, similar to those we've already discussed for PACs, but atrial flutter may reflect a much more serious problem and may be a sign of some serious underlying cardiac disease. In atrial fibrillation, numerous irritated sites are firing rapidly in no pattern and they cause the atria to quiver and produce no effective contraction. The loss of atrial kick can reduce cardiac output by up to 20%, but many patients will tolerate it quite well as long as their ventricular rate is appropriate. The AV node is being bombarded with impulses, and it filters them, allowing impulses to move to the ventricles, but it allows them to move through random and irregularly. Once the impulses get past the AV node, then they follow a normal conduction pathway, meaning the QRS complexes are typically narrow and relatively normal in appearance, or matching the appearance of that patient's normal QRS complexes. There are two simple keys to identifying atrial fib quickly and effectively. First, the baseline is erratic without clear identifiable P waves. Sometimes there are no clear P waves at all, and sometimes there are lots of them showing the evidence of that erratic firing of atrial cells, but they aren't in any sort of consistent organized order. Second, the rhythm is irregularly irregular. I'll say that again. The rhythm is irregularly irregular. So if you see narrow QRS complexes in an irregularly irregular pattern and no clear discernible P waves, that rhythm is atrial fib until proven otherwise. Atrial fib usually reflects a chronic disease state related to underlying heart issues, such as CHF, mitral stenosis, other valve issues, and it can be related to excessive caffeine, tobacco, stress, other factors. Keep in mind that the clinical significance of either atrial flutter or atrial fib is usually tied directly to the ventricular rate. If the patient has a reasonably normal ventricular rate, they're likely to tolerate these rhythms very well. Patients can be in acute distress, however, when the ventricular response is rapid or uncontrolled. In those cases, the ventricles don't have time to adequately fill and patients can become profoundly hypotensive. To clearly identify which situation we're talking about when we're identifying a flutter or a fib, we label atrial flutter and atrial fib rhythms based on the ventricular rate. If the ventricular rate is 60 to 100, we call it controlled, such as atrial fibrillation with a controlled ventricular response. If the ventricular rate is greater than 100, we call it a rapid ventricular response, or RVR. And so you'll hear people refer to atrial fib or AFib with RVR. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about an atrial fibrillation as the underlying rhythm with the ventricles going too fast, which is what causes patients to be symptomatic from it and often requires intervention. To summarize, we identify a rhythm as atrial when a P wave is present, but it looks different than the normal P waves in an underlying rhythm, leading us to suspect it is not coming from the sinus node. The P waves may be shaped different or even inverted, and the PR interval is typically shorter than normal. If that atrial rhythm is going faster than 100, we call it an atrial tachycardia. If we see three or more different looking P waves, we have to assume we have at least that many points of origin and we label it as either a wandering atrial pacemaker or as a multifocal atrial tachycardia if it's fast. Atrial flutter is identified by that classic sawtooth pattern of the baseline, and atrial fibrillation is identified by the fact that there are no discernible P waves and the ventricular rhythm is irregularly irregular. With flutter or fib, we further need to identify if the ventricular response is controlled or if there is a rapid ventricular response.